1 Corinthians 14. We'll read one verse together. We're reading from the King James Bible. If you have a Bible, if you don't have a Bible, there should be a pew Bible in there, a King James Bible, pure Cambridge edition. Um, we're going to read one verse together, 1 Corinthians 14 and verse number 8. Verse number 8. Let's read together. For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound... Who shall prepare himself to the battle? I'm going to talk to you this morning about communicating. Communicating. I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you bless now this morning the sermon. Thank you, Lord, for these dear folks, for their faithfulness. I pray that you bless them uh, for being faithful. They could, they could have been anywhere else. They chose to be here this morning. They're not here by accident. It's not a coincidence. It's by design. And so I pray that you bless them. I pray this will be a help. I think it will if we listen, pay attention. And I pray, Lord, that you watch over those that are working, those who are sick, uh, recovering, uh, those who are traveling, Lord, bring them home back safely. And uh, Lord, just thank you again for loving us. Thank you for salvation that we have through Lord Jesus. And dear Jesus, now, dear Holy Spirit of God, please bless uh, this service, the singing, the preaching, uh, the fellowship together. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. I'm going to start reading in verse number 7 here, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, starting in verse number 7. And even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood. How shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. If the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? You know, if you've ever been in the military, you don't have to be in the military. If you've ever watched movies or learned anything about uh, military, you know that there's different sounds, trumpet sounds, uh, especially, I hate to say olden times, but, you know, uh, for revelry. When revelry sounds... Everybody gets out of bunk, you know. It'd be good once in a while for you to get up before the sun gets up. Uh -huh. Some people don't even know the sun comes up gradually, you know. They get up at 10 o'clock and say, wow, where'd that ball of fire come from, amen, you know. It's good for you to get up early in the morning, amen. But there's a different sound. The trumpeter, you know, blows a bugle there. There's a different sound for attack. Most people know that because if you've ever been to a ball game, you know, charge, you know. You know, I forget it. You don't want me to do it. But there's, there's a different sound for the bugle or the trumpet for charge. There's also a different sound for a retreat. You know, when I was in boot camp, uh, it was boot camp, uh, we were going through uh, different uh, directions. They say, uh, the drill instructor would say, uh, two steps to the left. And you say, two steps to the left, aye, aye, sir. He said, two steps to the right, aye, aye, sir. Two steps to the forward, uh, you, and you repeat, two steps forward, aye, aye, sir. And he said, two steps back. And the answer will be, never, never, sir. Christians ought never go back. Christians ought never to retreat. We ought never to surrender, amen? But unless uh, you know the sound and the direction, you won't know what to do. And so communicating is lost on us today. And uh, I, I feel sorry sometimes for you folks because... Uh, Having worked in the court system for 40 years as a court reporter, it was drilled into me about punctuation and, and spelling and words and using proper grammar. And sometimes when you deal with people, people don't even know how to punctuate. People don't know how to use grammar. When's the last time you saw somebody use cursive in writing? I mean, that's a lost art today. Calligraphy. Nobody knows anything about calligraphy today. 
But, you know, one of the first things you had to learn in school was to learn cursive, you know. And uh, we, you know what you learn now? Ebonics. That's what people know, that in gutter languages, you don't even know how to speak the proper king's English. And there ought to be a, a proper balance about, um, I don't want to get to the point where, I'm, where we are so sophisticated and so professional that we lose touch with uh, people. I'm not saying that. But for God's people, you ought to grow and mature to learn how to communicate properly. And too many times we come from backgrounds, ah, it doesn't, it's not important. Well, it is. There's a famous commercial years ago, you, remember, you may remember it, uh, people judge you by the words you use. And that's very true. People do judge you by the words you use or the words you don't use. And so there's not, if you don't know a word in the Bible, why don't you get your dictionary out and look it up? I have an 1828 Webster's Dictionary that I look it up. Uh, if I didn't know a word, I just look it up and see what God said. I don't change the word of God because I may not know what it means. But that's what theologians and scholars that hate God and hate the word of God, that's what they do. They change it to make it easier. They dumb you down is what they're doing. No, God wants you to grow up and mature. And so uh, grammar is important, more important than you think. Speaking is more important than you think. And communicating to people correctly is more important than what you think it is. Um, you remember when you went to school, uh, you asked the teacher, you know, can I? And the teacher said, I don't know, can you? You should have learned early in school, there's a difference between can you and may you. Can I and may I. There's a big difference between those two words. One of my favorite judges, uh, Judge Hummel, he's on the federal bench now, but uh, he, he was, I was, it was great being a court reporter with him, except he talked faster than any other living person I've ever heard in my life. But he would ask, you know, the lawyers or sometimes uh, respondents or defendants or, or whoever was in court a question, and they wouldn't answer the question. Because that's how most people are. You don't think about it. You just want to talk what's on your mind. You don't pay attention to what the question is. And he said, let me ask you a better question. And he asked the exact same question to make people focus on the question that was asked. And sometimes it would be the third time. He said, let me ask you a better question. And he asked a third question the exact same way because people don't listen and pay attention to the question that's being asked. You're just so used to not communicating correctly. It's, it's, it's like a habit. When I was uh, working in New York City as a court reporter, I was traveling from Troy, New York. We used to live here at the old building and going back and forth, I'd go back three or four times a week I used to listen to Bob Grant on the radio. He was a forefather of all uh, modern day radio hosts, I think. Uh, and so uh, Bob Grant had taught and trained his audience in a way I've never heard anyone else do because uh, people would call up, you know, and you're in New York City, you got eight million people there at your disposal. You know, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands would listen to this radio station. A lot of them would get on the radio and the first thing they'd say, Bob, how are you? He cut them off. Next. Who cares how high I am, he said. He said, do you know how much time is wasted by little chit-chat that you don't really care how I am, but you get used to, how are you today? For what reason? Do you really care how somebody is? Now, if you are, ask that person, how are you? I want to know how you're doing. But for a radio station, you're wasting 5, 10, 15 minutes over a three, four hour period of time just to, hey, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. How are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. That's not why you have a radio station. His question would be, what's on your mind? And sometimes he'd get ticked off. He was an old Italian fella. He'd get ticked off. He'd go on a rant. Who cares how I am? Let's talk about what you want to talk about. Don't ask me how I am. I don't want to know how you are. I want to talk about what's important to you. Now, I'm not saying you should be like that to individuals if you're seriously sincere about asking about somebody's welfare. But that's an indication about people not knowing how to communicate correctly or when. Uh, somebody at the courthouse, can't remember, some judge's secretary went down south and uh, they went out to a restaurant to eat and she was, this is about 10 years ago, she told me this, and uh, she was down south with somebody, I don't know who she was with, her husband or somebody else, and they were there, and the, she asked the waitress, uh, I don't know where they were down south, they said, how you doing? And the waitress took about 10 or 15 minutes and told, told the woman how she's doing. See, up here in the Northeast, you just say it because you're out of habit saying it. You don't really believe it, or you don't really mean it when you say, how you doing? Down South, they'll tell you for about 10, 15 minutes how they're really doing. And what I'm saying is, what we have is a lack of communication. 
Some famous philosopher said that in some famous movie. Amen. <laughs> but that's, that's so true in society today. There is a lack of communication. And people don't know how to communicate probably because they, don't, they haven't been taught that. And I'm not here to teach you how to communicate necessarily, but I am telling you it's very important how you communicate and what you communicate. There ought to be no doubt in anybody's mind what you think the preacher believes when he's preaching. It ought to be very, very rare when you walk out of here and say, I wonder what he was talking about today. Have you ever been in church services and you say, man, I wonder what the pastor was talking about today. I don't understand everything he said. Well, you may not like it. And you may not agree with it. You may love it. But there should be no question about what I'm saying. Amen. Because we should use words that are easy to be understood, not highfalutin words, not three, four, five, six syllable words that most people don't understand. And I'm not against using those kind of words, but we ought to use words that are easy to understand for everybody, whether it's a five or 10 year old boy or girl, whether it's 70 or 80 year old person, everybody should understand basically what the sermon, what the message is about. And that's ought to be your life, how you communicate to people the same way. People ought to know what you're talking about. Um, the story is told where a wife had laryngitis and she couldn't talk. Don't you pray for your wife to have laryngitis? All right. But anyway, so uh, she couldn't talk and she had laryngitis. And so the husband came out with a plan and says, here's what we're going to communicate until you get over laryngitis. Says, I'm going to tap once means yes. If I tap two times, that means no. If I tap 95 times, it means take out the garbage. I thought it was pretty funny, but anyway. Do you, ever, do you ever remember the first time you ever heard yourself talk on a recorded audio? And your voice was nasally grating. It's, oh, I have a disgusting voice. Whether it's high pitch, you think, or squeaky. You say, oh. But the, you notice the first thing I ever learned, or the first thing that came to my mind, was how many times I said, uh, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-uh. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know what it is? Being lazy in not wanting to learn how to communicate properly. And I'm not, look, I'm not trying to be overly critical, but I'm just telling you, you'd be shocked how, how you fall into a trap, into a gutter, and don't get out by using words, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-uh, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. You can say yes, you can say no. You don't have to be grunting. Uh, when we used to pastor the Greek evangel uh, the Greek evangelical church, the Greek Baptist church in Astoria down in New York City, uh, my wife and I used to travel down to Taconic. I used to listen to some left-wing socialist P PBS, you know, radio stations. And one guy on there that I don't particularly care, but he's really, I think he's funny. He had, a, he had recorded people the last, I don't know, two, three, four weeks uh, or five weeks or a couple months of everybody saying so. So they started off their sentence, had nothing to do with the word so, but they're so <laughs> used to, now I use that properly, okay? They're so used to saying so, they start all their sentences with so, and it was hilarious. It went for all, on for about a minute or two, nothing but audio clips of people starting off, I'm talking about TV commentators, news people saying, I, people in the media I'm talking about, not average po f folks, people in the media say so, 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 and it was hilarious. Just like people say, well, you know, you know, you know, you know, and they just throw, you know, you know, you know, do you know? I'm just saying, we live in, a, in, a, in an age today where people have a lack of communication. And communication is very important, especially when you're fighting a war, especially when you're in a battle, especially when you're preaching, especially when you're teaching especially when you're directing people. You ought to know how to communicate properly. And sometimes we're too flippant in whether we're communicating right or not. Um, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 9, 26, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beat at the air. He said in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 7, we brought nothing into the world and it is certain we can carry nothing out. He said in verse 17, he said, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches. 
in Proverbs uh, 23, verse 5, he says, Riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. These are very simple, easy words to be understood. They're certain. People ought to know that you're certain about certain things. People, people ought to know that you convey the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ correctly. That's why we get upset all the time with people who use the word repent. They, they bastardize that word repent. They change the definition of the word repent. Repent in the Bible means to change your mind, period. Not change your life, not stop a sin, not start a sin, not, not turn over a new leaf. Repent in the Bible means to change your life. But the average person doesn't even know what repent means. The average believer doesn't know what the word repent means. And so you're trying to tell somebody you've got to change your life in order to get saved. That's a work salvation. You have to stop a sin in order to be saved. That's a work salvation. You're not saved by works, you're saved by grace. You're saved by the mercy of God Almighty. And we ought to make the, the message plain and simple to people about salvation and not complicated. Hebrews 10, 27 says, it is, a fear, it is a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. It's a certain thing that you're going to die. You're going to die. People ought to need to hear that because people, they don't think they're going to die. You know, if you go on a soul one and talk to people on the street corner, uh, you'd be shocked. Some of these teenagers, I don't know if they're high or not or what they're on, but some people have told me, you know, I'm not going to die. It's like Michael Jackson are saying, you know, they're going to live in an oxygen tank. You know, they're not going to die. They want to live forever on this earth. Friend, you're going to die. Neighbor, you are going to die. That is certain. You ought to be communicating to people that you don't know when you're going to die. You don't know when you're going to take your last breath. You're going to meet God. That is certain in the Bible. You are going to stand before a holy God and give an account of everything you've ever done, everything you've ever said, and everything you've ever thought of. That is a certainty. You ought to communicate that to people. There is a place called hell that people die if they're lost. They're going to burn in hell for all eternity. That is a certainty. We ought to communicate that to people. Not go out in some state of, of uh, non-existence somewhere. No. People who, are, who have rejected Jesus Christ are going to burn in a place called hell. We need to communicate that. Clearly. Distinctly. So people understand. God said in Proverbs 22, Have not I written to thee excellent things in counsels and knowledge that I, may, that I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth? Luke 1, 4, That thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. You don't think grammar or punctuation or using words are correct? Or are that important? Ah, it doesn't matter, Pastor. I don't have to go to college. You don't have to go to college. I'm not saying you have to go to college. But you need to communicate correctly. In 1872, this is while uh, Grant was a president, traitor, the federal government passed a new tariff law. Price Economics points out this, listen to me good, a tiny punctuation error in the law wound up costing the government, that, back then in the 1860s, $2 million. The previously passed Tariff Act specified that, I'm quoting now, fruit plants, comma, tropical and semi-tropical for the purpose of propagation or cultivation, close quote, were exempt from import tariff. Somebody stuck in a comma by mistake. And when it went into the record, it said this, quote, fruit, comma, plants, comma, tropical and semi-tropical for the purpose of propagation and cultivation. So instead of fruit plants not being taxed and being exempted, fruit now was exempted and plants were being exempted. That cost the government $2 million for one or two years because somebody put a comma between fruit and plants. If you don't think a comma is that important, it costs the government a lot of money. Think about this. Google earns $497 million each year from people mistyping the names of popular websites and they land on what they call a typo squatter site which happens to be littered with Google ads. 
So Google knows that people will misspell when they're searching. It will go to one of a site that they have Google ads on. They make about $500 million extra a year just from people putting in the wrong, uh, the, the misspellings of searches. A missing P, just one P was missing. An eBay seller lost half a million dollars on a 150-year-old beer that he was auctioning off on eBay. Few people knew that a bottle of Allsop's Arctic Ale was up for bid because instead of putting two P's, this guy put in one P. The bidder bought it for $304 because he was, somehow he found out about it. He turned around right away and sold it for $503,000. So the seller of this beer that was 150 years old only put one P in the name. The other guy who found out bought it real cheap turned around and made a half a million dollars. One P. You don't think spelling is important? You don't think a comma is important? You don't think how you communicate is important? There's so many here, I'm skipping here. Uh, you remember uh, President, uh, Vice President Dan Quell with the potato? He put an E on the end, you know why? Because that's what the cue card said when somebody gave it to him. He was at a spelling bee or spelling quiz in a school and he, he was uh, vice president running for re-election with uh, the former, the first George Bush. Somebody gave him, they had a spelling quiz in a school and some kid wrote potato with an O. But the cue card that vice president Quayle got had an E on the end. He said, that's wrong. He's supposed to have an E on the end. Now you would think a vice president would know that but you would probably be led astray too if somebody gave you a, 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 a cue card with an E on the end, not knowing, and, and being caught up in the moment and put pressure on, saying, oh, I didn't know that it had an E. Was, did it have, does it have an E? And he lost the re-election, and they made fun of it. If you remember, they, made, they, they tore him up because of that. In, in 1631, London's Baker Bookhouse printed the Ten Commandments with a missing word in the Seventh Commandment. Instead of saying, thou shalt not commit adultery, it said, thou shalt commit adultery. I think that one word, uh, it, it's called the Wicked Bible, W-I-C-K-E-D, Wicked. That's what it's called. They, got, they burned most of it, they got rid of it, but there's some that's still around, I guess. Only nine of the original editions exist today. But King Charles I um, burned the rest of them and they find the London publisher 3,000 pounds back then. The Pasta Bible by Lee Blaylock, published by Penguin Australia in 2010, had to be reprinted in Australia after one recipe for a plate of, I don't know what it is, tagliatelle with sardines and prosciutto. I don't know what that is, but some of you may know what it is. They had the recipe for it in their book, in their recipe book. Except they, re they misprinted the recipe. It's supposed to say, uh, quote, salt and freshly ground black pepper. But instead, they printed salt and freshly ground black people. Uh, that's just a little bit of a mistake, don't you think? Uh, you don't think proof? Hey, don't tell me it hasn't happened to you that you messed up sending a text or an email and uh, you were embarrassed, you sent the wrong word or autocorrect, did something to it, you know? And then you saw it after you sent it? You know what I'm talking about? This is an interesting one. A capital D or a small d is the abbreviation for density. Okay? Scientific terms. So somebody writing the, this, this dictionary in the New International Dictionary in 1934 put D, capital D, or... D, and they, that's used, either the capital D or the small letter D, is the, is the uh, abbreviation for density. Except when somebody read D or D, they clumped them all together and put in the dictionary a word, D-O-R-D, with no definition afterward, until they changed it many years later. So it's important to proofread what you write, it's important to proofread what you text or email because words matter. And, and people do uh, judge you by the words that you use. 
So you ought to be careful about what, you, what kind of words you use and how you, how you uh, communicate to people. In 1 Corinthians 15, 33, the Bible says, Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. That's what the Bible says. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Television, worldly movies, videos, and pictures. Worldly and ungodly music, radio programs. Intelligent lawyers, when I was doing jury training, I don't I haven't seen this in the last 10 years, but you know, 20, 30 years ago, very good attorneys during jury selection would ask the prospective jurors, what books do you read? Uh, what kind of hobbies do you have? What kind of occupation do you have? What, what's your favorite movie? You know why? Because all these things go into the mindset of the juror, and the lawyer will decide whether he wants that juror or not, depending upon what the case is about. Well, everything, you today are an accumulation of everything that you've ever experienced in life. Everything you've ever seen, everything you've ever heard, or everything you've ever sensed with any of your senses. Even things that you don't even remember can affect you even up to today. So you are an accumulation of everything that's been communicated to you. Everything you've seen, everything you've heard. So the Bible is very clear that evil communications corrupt good manners. The reason why people don't have good manners is because they've been watching and listening to the devil's music. I know, you don't like rock and roll music and heavy metal, but you like country music that talks about getting drunk on liquor and uh, uh, sleeping with your best friend's girlfriend and uh, uh, the, you're out with your dog, you know. It, evil communications corrupt good manners. What are you watching? What, what are you listening to? You know, it's interesting. The people that hate this book, they change it. The theologians and scholars that hate the King James Bible, they revise it and they change it because they hate God. But here's what. You know the word, you know some words in the Bible? The word damn is in the Bible. Hell is in the Bible. Bastard is in the Bible. Whore is in the Bible. I can't tell you how many times I used to use the word, still do, but when I preach on, on something, I use the word whore. Somebody, one of the kids, like an eight, ten year old kid, go, what? What? Like, you're not supposed, that's a, that's blasphemy, and that's a profane word, and you're not supposed to use it. No, a whore is like a harlot or a prostitute, and you shouldn't, you shouldn't live like a whore. So that's in the Bible, it's Bible language. But you know what's interesting? The same fake, phony theologians that hate this book will change those words, but they'll watch our movies. They'll watch videos. They'll listen to music and videos and dance to the most vulgar, obscene language and repeat those words with no problem at all. Now, it's the fact that they hate the Word of God. They hate the Word of God. They hate the Word of God. We, we're, we're supposed to communicate clearly to everyone. Matthew 5, 28, the Bible says, But I say unto Jesus, said, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. I know it's almost winter time, the middle of November, but you know what? Let me say this, ladies. You get what you attract. You, you attract what you advertise. When you walk half naked down the street, I don't care where it's at, and you're advertising nakedness to somebody, you're attracting that mindset. Now, look, some men are just perverted. There's nothing you can do to dress right because they just have an evil, wicked mindset. You could be dressed in a barrel and, no, and somebody would still whistle and catcall you. But if you're showing your nakedness and showing your body to the opposite sex in public and you're attracting somebody like that and you marry somebody like that, don't be so shocked 20, 30 years later when that same fellow that you attracted is going to go for the 20 or 30 year younger version that attracted him in the first place. You see, if you attract somebody with godliness or holiness or the love of God and love of the Word of God and love of church, you know, 20, 30 years later when the wrinkles come in and the gray hair starts coming in or you have health problems, the love of God will still go further. The love of God will still go further than your, your gray hair. The love of God will still go further than your, aching, your aging body. How are you communicating to people? What are you communicating to people? 
God's people ought to be careful about the language that they use. Ephesians chapter number 4, 29 says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. You ought to watch your mouth. People are immature today and they use gutter language. I don't care if you're at work. I don't care at the office. I don't care if uh, people are saying dirty jokes. God's people ought to use clean words. Not use gutter language. You know, your mind is more complex than the, 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 the biggest or, or newest computer. But the same principle applies. They call it T-I-T-O. Trash in, trash out. You speak the words you speak because it's in your heart and you heard that. I don't know about you, but I had closed my mouth for a long time after I got saved because I was, I was afraid of some of the words I used to say would come out inadvertently. So I kept my mouth closed for a long time. You better be careful about the words that you use. Marriages have been destroyed because of words that were not used correctly or words that shouldn't have been used. Relationships have been destroyed because people use the wrong words. And fellas, same thing. You know, ladies, if you want your husband to do something, don't hint. Don't beat around the bush. Don't, don't throw clues out. Just tell them what you want. Men just want to hear straight. But men, the same thing applies to you too. God doesn't throw hints out. He tells you exactly how you're supposed to live. God, you're not here saying, I wonder what God says. No, it's right here. Clear and plain. Plain and simple. So the same argument that you have about your wife is the same argument God has for you. Say, God, I, I want God to speak to me. Well, get a Bible and start reading it. Say, God doesn't speak to me anymore. Get a Bible and read it. This is God's word. This is his voice. This is the word of God. God will speak to you when you read it. You want clues, don't you? You want Colonel Mustard. If he used gas in the chamber to kill the... No, I better not go there. You know, you know God's very clear about what he calls the Greeks. They're always liars and lazy. God hasn't changed in 2,000 years, man. Pick it up and read it, man. I wouldn't trust the Greek. They're not good on direction. I'll get more into that tonight. They're not good on time or direction, man. Don't ever trust the Greek when it comes to time or direction. It's always Greek time, amen? If you want a Greek to show up on time, tell them 30 minutes earlier, amen? Number one, can you believe I got points here? Number one, be not deceived. Evil communication corrupt good manners. Number two, watch your mouth. Number three, Hebrews 13, 16 says to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. It takes sacrifice to, for you to communicate correctly. You've got to learn. You've got to teach your mouth how to talk right. When's the last time you sat down and actually wrote a physical letter to a missionary overseas? We have missionaries that we support are overseas, man. Mexico, Philippines, Australia. Do you know what Australia is going through right now? Burma, we have other missionaries we support overseas. When's the last time you sat down and wrote an encouraging letter to somebody? Not a text, not an email, but a physical letter that was heartfelt that they could receive and they could keep and read it and put it up on the refrigerator and read it over and over again. I still have the letters my wife sent me when I was in boot camp. I still have the letters that my mom sent me when I was in boot camp. So, you know, these, these letters are tear-stained. These letters are from the heart, man. Before texting, before uh, um, internet, before all that stuff, and everybody just texts LOL now. Everything's abbreviated. You don't even write things out no more. And I look, I use those too. But I'm just saying that's how our entire society has, has come to. We don't know how to communicate properly. Too busy? I don't think they were too busy to sacrifice living in America, going to an overseas country somewhere. And we don't have the time to sit down and just write them a letter. It takes sacrifice. And God says, with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. To communicate, forget not, the Bible says. Number four. I said, number one, be not deceived. God's not mocked. Evil communications corrupt good manners. God's not mocked is not in that verse, but it's true. Number two, watch your mouth. Number three, sacrifice to communicate properly. Number four, share the gospel correctly. 
Share the gospel correctly. Philemon, verse number 6, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. When's the last time you correctly communicated the gospel to a lost sinner and told that lost sinner that they're going to die and burn in hell if they don't receive Jesus Christ as their Savior before they die and take their last breath? Amen. You ought to be very clear in presenting the gospel. As I said, repent means to change your mind only. That's why they're upset at us. Anybody says, any pastor, theologian, religious leader ever says they're not really saved is lying. Anybody that uses a phrase, well, they sinned, they did that, she said that, she did that, he went there, and they say, well, they're not really saved. I want somebody to show me where in the Bible that says that. Where in the Bible does it say that because you sin, you're not really saved? Amen. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Paul said, I'm chiefest. You, you think too highly of yourself. These pastors and theologians make themselves out to be God, and they want people to reach their bar. God makes it so low that even a five- or seven-year-old boy or girl can get saved. Amen? A five- or seven-year-old boy doesn't change their life. They don't change from their sins. They just trust Jesus Christ to be their Savior the same way somebody in their 70s or 80s gets saved. We ought to be clean, clear, and, and crystal clear about presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 37, let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. In Luke 24, 17, he said unto them, it was after the resurrection, he said, what manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? I want to ask you a question. Why are you sad today? Are you saved? Are you a child of God? Are you saved from hell? Are you going to go to heaven when you die? Or is your heart more in, in, involved in this world and in this life and in people more than Jesus Christ? I have heartaches and I have burdens and I have trials, but blessed be God, I'm going to go to heaven when I die. Blessed be God, I'm going to be with Jesus when I die. Blessed be God, all things on earth are going to pass away. All my burdens, all my heartaches, all my trials are going to be gone. There's no reason for me to be sad. I'm sad for America. I'm sad for America. I'm sad for this generation. But blessed be God, I'm going to go to heaven when I die. Amen? Amen. Why are you sad all the time? Are you born again? Are you saved from hell? Amen. If you're saved, you don't have any problems. You just think you have problems. Amen. Bible says to be content with such things as you have. Amen? Amen. Ought, we ought not to be like BLM and Antifa. They use vulgar language. They, they're, they're a bunch of thugs and criminals. They hate God. They hate the Bible. Amen. They hate life. You, you and I ought to enjoy what God's given us, amen? I don't know why you're sad. I don't know why, why you're so caught up in this world. Have you been reading the Bible? Have you read Revelation 22, man? It's, a, it's the last chapter in the book. We get to win, amen? We win. There, there, there's persecution beforehand. There's trials beforehand. There's burdens beforehand. But read the end of the book, amen? We get to win. We're, in, we're, we're with Jesus, Amen? Blessed be God, I love church, I love preaching. I love the old time religion. I love the King James Bible. I love what God has done. He saved my soul from hell. Sure, things aren't going the way you want them to go, and things aren't going the way I want them to go sometimes. But is that more important than communicating correctly to people the joy of the Lord? Because the joy of the Lord is your strength. That's what the Bible says. So many believers today, all, you know what they do on social media? Tell everybody all their problems. They tell everybody how bad they got it. They tell everybody everything that goes wrong in their life. Aren't they saved? Don't you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Don't you believe there's going to be a resurrection one day? Don't you believe we're all going to be together in heaven one day? Don't you believe that? Well, tell about Jesus, amen. amen. You don't know how bad I have it. You don't know what happened this week. And you don't know what they said to me. And you don't know what my boss did to me. And I had diarrhea, and this is the color that it was. And let me take a picture so you know how bad it was. And I stubbed my toe this week, and you don't know what my kids said, and you don't know what my husband and my, fa my father said, my wife and my mother said, and you don't know what my neighbor did to me. I'm really struggling. You ought to read your Bible, man. You ought to get right with God. And instead of having a, a sourpuss face all the time, people want to see joy and love that only comes through the believers that love Jesus Christ. Are you communicating clearly? 
Are you communicating what God wants you to communicate to the world? Why, why should a lost person want the God that you communicate? Why would a lost person see somebody who believe, says they believe in God but is miserable? Complaining, critical all the time of others. Never joyful, never happy, never singing, never smiling. Blessed be God, World War III can, can start and I'm going to still sing, amen? My hope and my joy doesn't depend on the White House, the Governor's Mansion, or City Hall Mayor. My joy depends on the Lord Jesus Christ and God changeth not, amen? And I want to communicate that to everybody I possibly can. Even with my burdens, even with my heartaches, even with the trials of life, even with my disappointments, I want to communicate to everyone I know there's a God in heaven who can save your soul from hell. People judge you by the words you use. People judge you by how you act and how you behave. People judge you by how you walk and how you, uh, your manners. So be careful. Be careful on how you live, what you believe, how you communicate. You think I'm being too picky you sometimes? I understand. I understand. But it's important to, to train people to speak correctly and use the right words. Learn directions. Read a map. Learn how to read a map. So I, I, I'm not good at reading a map. Then learn to know which way to go. Get a compass out and learn how to read a compass. Get the compass of life right here. November 1978, 43 years ago this month, I received a love letter from heaven. It wasn't a text. It wasn't an email. It wasn't a meme. It was a written word of God. Amen. And I've never gotten over the love that I've had for this book. Because this word comes straight from God's mouth. And God is communicating to me clearly everything he wants me to know. And your duty, your job, and my job is to communicate the truths found in this book clearly to everyone else. Regardless what it is about what the subject is, whether it's music, dress, church, health, finances, doesn't matter. We need to communicate clearly what God says. I know people don't like the message. I know people sometimes hate the message. I know that. But the same message that they hate is the same message that you love. That's why you're here this morning. Why would you come back? Now, I understand the first time you come in, came in by mistake, Amen. Somebody fooled you, deceived you, and tricked you to come. And somebody invited you here, amen? But if you're here after the second or third or fourth time, there's something that beats inside of you that loves this book. Because we're not, we haven't equivocated. We're unequivocated. We're clearly speaking and preaching and teaching the entire counsel of the Word of God to the best of our ability. And we're trying to do it as clearly as we can. So the same truths that people hate are the same truths that people love. And we attract what we communicate. We are advertising exactly what we're advertising. An old-fashioned hellfire and damnation, independent, fundamental, separated, soul-winning, street-preaching, King James-only Baptist church. I'm not going to sugarcoat anything. I'm not going to compromise. The world loves compromise. They want, they want us to compromise because yet they hate the message. No, we want to clearly, clearly communicate the truths found in the Word of God. If some pastor doesn't use a King James Bible in the English language, he's a fake, phony, and a fraud. He's a liar. He's lazy. He's ignorant. I wouldn't trust anything that person says. Any person. I don't care what their education is. I don't care what their theology school said. Doesn't matter to me. If they don't know that the King James Bible is the word in the English language, they're lying to you. They're lying. Every single one of them. But how about so-and-so? Every single one of them. I don't care how big their church is, their, their following is, doesn't matter to me. I want to clearly communicate that they're liars. Hear what I just said? I want to clearly communicate. I don't want you to say, Pastor, what do you really think about that? No. Some people come up to me afterwards kiddingly and say, Pastor, what do you really think about the subject I just preached about, you know? No, I don't, I don't want anybody to have any questions about what I believe. I don't want anybody having any questions, especially in this church, what the Bible says about certain subjects. Let's communicate 
distinctly. For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? Let's all stand. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you, Lord, for, for the word of God this morning. Thank you, Lord, for these dear folks for their faithfulness. Dear Heavenly Father, sometimes, and we're all guilty of this, and we've all been dumbed down in some, to, to some degree about not using the proper words. We've gotten away with it so long that no one's, um, no one's uh, I guess, uh, put, us on, uh, put us on the, uh, <laughs> can't even find the words, uh, came face to face with us and, and really just questioned us what we just said or what we believed or what we uh, communicated to somebody else. And it all helps us to communicate even better in the future, clearer in the future to someone else when we use the right words. Whether it's for uh, sharing the gospel or whether it's, it's in a relationship or whether it's from preaching or teaching or whether it's uh, at work. Oh dear God, help us to be very careful about the words that we use. We're going to be judged by the very words that we're using. Lord, thank you Lord for these dear folks. Please bless them for their faithfulness. Bless this invitation. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.